so to visit his grandmother and uh, take them fast to fruit, which I did when uh, his grandfather was alive. So great pack, and then his uh, uh, uncle, uh, uncle, his great uncle, David, was in my class in, uh, in school, and he was very smart, and he's passed away. Okay, well. Let me call on uh, Professor Carrie Taylor for some introductory remarks. And let me say it's just a pleasure working with Carrie, and, uh, and we, we co-taught, or, or he taught, and I assisted some of the class last semester, uh, which was about to do South, and um, in, in broader issues, and really enjoyed it. And Carrie's been a huge help in setting this class up, and of course we'll be working with them directly and in each class period and he'll be signing readings and uh, you'll have a great chance to get to know him. Okay? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just, you know, very quickly, um, the, um, so uh, uh, Professor Kerry Taylor, I've been in the Citadel History Department for, I think this is my eighth year. I'm a 20th century American historian with uh, strong interests in labor history and the history of the civil rights movement. Um, I also am the uh, director of the Citadel's Oral History Initiative, and if any of you have any interest in getting involved in uh, oral history or conducting interviews with um, uh, you know, people who've been uh, direct participants in historical events, we'll have a chance to talk about that over the course of the semester. One of the demands, uh, uh, course requirements of the class is that you conduct an oral history interview at some point in the semester. So we'll. Uh, you know, we'll get into that, uh, you know, a bit more later in the semester. But, um, you know, I've, I've also had the chance, well, I've, I've had several of you in my past classes, so it's good to see some uh, repeats, um, uh, you know, uh, back for this class. Um, and I, I've had a chance to sit down with several of you over the, the last couple days, and um, so I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot more than I've already told you, but I do want to reiterate um, that, uh, you know, both the mayor and I believe strongly that the success of this class really depends on your doing the weekly readings and your participating in the, the conversation. So whether it's uh, our conversation, um, you know, uh, in the first hour of the class or after 3.30 when we have our, our uh, you know, we've got, I think it's about 50 guests lined up to come over the course of the semester. So you're going to be meeting uh, really in a lot of ways a who's who of uh, you know, recent Charleston history. And that's a, a you know, you, you, this is an unbelievable uh, opportunity to, um, to uh, you know, directly engage the people who are responsible for shaping modern Charleston. And so we want to really encourage you to come to class prepared with comments and questions, and I'll say this, and, and uh, you know, I think the, the mayor will tell you the same thing: is that you need to feel free to ask anything. I mean, if something, you know, you, you, um, the, the the mayor's, you know, he, he he can take a punch. You know, he's been in politics for uh, you know fifty, uh, close to fifty years, and so you need to ask the tough questions. Uh, don't don't hesitate to um, you know anything that, that we tell you. Um, you know, we don't expect you to take that at face value, you know, so, so feel free to, to, you know, ask tough questions, uh, come prepared with comments and your own analysis of the reading. Maybe the, the last thing I might mention about this class that, that uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this in um, the, the last couple weeks is that in many ways, uh, the recent election, I think, gives this class an added urgency. Because in a sense, you could make an argument that a significant number of the American public, not the majority, I would mind you, uh, but a significant minority have rejected the kind of pragmatic liberalism that the mayor has been a champion of and that the, uh, the uh, outgoing president was a champion of. So, um, I think that challenge to the pragmatic liberalism, which we'll you know, talk much more about, I think gives us uh, a really unique opportunity to look back on uh, what we've done here in Charleston over the, the past 40 years 
and to um, you know to to uh, you know begin to think about what what uh, you know what are the prospects for those kinds of politics that Mayor Riley has championed. So um, I won't say any more okay. at this point. Okay. But we'll meet. Um, you know, we'll have plenty of time to meet outside of class to you know talk a little bit in more detail about course expectations and, and uh, kind of the logistics and mechanics of the class. But welcome all. I'm, I'm uh, you know really glad to see so many familiar faces. And, and one kind of housekeeping matter is this: that if you feel sleepy, which is a natural human instinct, particularly if I'm talking. But it might be after getting up at 5 o'clock, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and eating lunch, you get tired, and I, I have a post-meal uh, eyelid sinking syndrome myself sometimes. <coughs> um, so if you do, get up and walk outside. Don't, don't be embarrassed about that. Don't, you know, you're fighting it. It's just too bad if you get up and move around. You're not going to hurt my feelings. So um, I gave you an article in the newspaper uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, which I hope you've had a chance to read. But if you haven't, uh, don't, don't, don't read it now. Uh, um, but um, but um, I would, this is the, this, if, if this were a short book this next semester, that would be the prologue to the prologue. And, um, and of course, it's a story about it a man who was homeless and uh, and at our phenomenal homeless shelter uh, 180 place uh, that his life turned around and that and um, so I, I give you that because this the, the job of mayor and and all the responsibilities of police and, and fire and redevelopment and city council and, and all of that and building and buildings and and, uh, and, and all, all of that that there's, there's, there's another really interesting dimension. And, uh, and I think in part explains why I uh, was eager to serve for four years. And um, it's because there's just so many opportunities uh, to do important things, to make things happen that maybe wouldn't have otherwise happened. And uh, years ago, a professor from the Northeastern College came to see me, he was writing a book about mayors. And uh, he said, you know, and I, I had all my facts and figures and all the stuff, city time, all that. And then he said, um, tell me, Mayor, have you uh, been engaged in creating any institutions? And so my first reaction was, I mean, I don't, there's no two institutions. And, but rather than use my first response in my thinking, um, I waited a minute and then I realized, of course. Um, and um, because is the mayor, you're the one person that, that the community, individuals, or, or causes, or observations of people can connect with, and you can leverage. So, it was the coldest winter that Charleston had experienced in my life. This was a long time ago, I was mayor. The, I call it the year that the oleanders died. Oleanders are evergreens you see around, and, um, but the, uh, the oleanders were killed. It was just too severe. But what happened was that, that all of a sudden, these people who were invincible, they were homeless, started showing up in the vestibules of churches or in the, the storefront of, of buildings. If where, they were, where they were staying, under cars or an abandoned house, it was too severe. And we then realized, that this was a long time ago, that there was a problem of homelessness in Charleston that we have been completely ignorant of. So a, a group of ministers and I got together. It was First Baptist Church, a First Scotch Presbyterian Church, uh, St. Michael's, a, a retired minister, another. And um, immediately we started talking about it. And one of them said, we ought to create a shelter for the homeless. And so, out there, and then I said, Well, we got this place above a rec center, St. Jude and Divine, and um, so we, we said we'd do that. And we announced we would have the shelter open. We didn't know if anybody would come, and um, it rather looked silly, you know. But we opened it, said one night, and um, 
that we brought out, got some cots and sleeping bags to spend the night there, and these people showed up. And, um, and then we did something that was really bad, but we brought them some donuts and crackers, and then those were gone in a minute. Realize that homeless people also other people. And so that then caused us to work and create a nonprofit. And we got volunteers involved, monthly in America does. And then we got the word out. And then, to make a long story short, that became the Interfaith Crisis Ministry, and that is now the one eighty place. And so that story, I guess 25 or 30 years later, with this man whose life was a dead end, now has a job, he's homeless, and that's, that's, that's just me having the opportunity as mayor to connect with people, to get people involved and engaged, and create an institution that didn't happen. So that's, that's just a, that's one of the things that a mayor can do if you're alert and engaged. Now, the interesting thing I would submit about this course is not that I'm teaching it, but it gives us a chance over these 40 years to look at the Charleston's experience in dealing with the changes in urban America. It's fascinating doing this because Charleston is a microcosm of urban America. It's small, smaller than New York City or Jersey City, um, but, but, but the American city during this period of time, and just before, was going through very uh, significant changes. And so how to address that, and how to solve the problems, how to understand the problems, and, um, and what to do. And then the, the, the job of mayor kept my attention, and I, I thought some of y'all might be, if you tell somebody, you report somebody, you know, you're taking this course, and you've got this guy who was Mayor Charles for 40 years teaching this course, and some of you say, why in the world would somebody want to be Mayor Charles for 40 years? I mean, you know, what, if this people are cutting ribbons, or what is, what, what do you, why would you be a mayor for 40 years? What, what in the world is he doing? And, um, and, and, and the reason is, that with that one tiny example, and I think I probably was involved in helping with citizens create 30, 40 uh, institutions, was that you have the opportunity every day to help you. The great mayor boss in Tom and Edom died five years ago, said what he loved about being mayor was that every day he could go to work and have a chance to help people and, and to be nice to people and leave the world a better place. So, what we will talk about in the next few minutes in this semester is how we face the challenges that the city of Charleston was experiencing. Um, I never thought of being mayor. I was. Um, interested in politics. I studied political science at the Citadel, but it interested in, in that um, before. And, um, but I had been in the legislature and uh, served for six years, loved the legislative work, very interesting. And I was young, 25, when I was elected, and we had a robust group of, of called Young Turks. We would change agents and working to make the state more progressive and responsive, and um, but we had two young children, and after six years, it was time to, to be home, practice law, and um, so I thought that was the conclusion of my public service. And the legislature was surprised. I remember Governor West, who's a Citadel graduate, you may know, called me down to his office when I announced I wasn't going to run for election. He was close to being destroyed. He said, Joe, we've had you know, great ambitions for you. You think Governor might be that. And I said, well, John, you know, at this, this time. So I came home to, you know, you're just in the legislature a couple days a week, but I thought my public service career was over. And I was satisfied with that. I enjoyed my work. And, um, and then I 
to see these urgings to run for mayor, the, um, in 1975. And the, um, Charleston, as the South, in the 60s and 70s, was going through a number of substantial changes, and, and many of them revolving in matters of race. Uh, when I went to the Citadel, there were no African American students here. When I went to Bishop Ingham High School, there were no African American students here. So in the city, I grew up in a, a society that was uh, operating under the Jim Crow laws and practices. And, um, and then after the Civil Rights Bill of 64, the Voter Rights Act of 65, uh, leadership of Lyndon Johnson and, and President Kennedy and others, uh, then, then things started changing, but that change was, was difficult and, and, and controversial and contentious. And many southern cities were, were dealing with um, just very difficult times of people being able to work together and so I was uh, urged to run for mayor by the African American leadership and the white business leadership um, to be a good one. And, um, and that's why I ran for mayor. I'll talk about all the wonderful challenges and issues uh, that we had, but, but that, was, that was my reason. I have been moved greatly by the leadership of Dr. King was uh, so interested and committed in the civil rights movement and in giving people of color the opportunity for, for full participation uh, and engagement in, in their community and in our society. And I also knew this, that Charleston couldn't be a great city unless it was a just city. And I use greatness in, that doesn't mean anything about size or any prominence, international or other, which some of which we may have, just in the quality of, of its existence to be, to excel, to be great, to, 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 to be um, worthy, to be admired, that it needed to be blessed. And um, so uh, that's why I ran for mayor and, um, and got elected, or I got elected. And, um, and then uh, I was um, 32. I had uh, never attended the city council meeting. Um, I'd, been, I'd been in the legislature. I knew Rock and Rules of Law. I knew how to work within a, within a legislative body. But I was a complete novice in the governance of the city. And, um, and then the, and I'll mention some of this to the other group later on, but it was very interesting in that the election was the 9th of December, and you took office on the 15th of December. So it was for not having any municipal government experience and only having six days to get ready for that was, uh, was rather uh, jarring. And, um, but uh, I had, you meet my campaign manager, a good friend, second, second class. And, um, and you know, what you do is, um, in life, you just show up. You show up for work. You know, roll up your sleeves. We were able to face the challenges, and um, so we did. The um, city council was elected during that election. Uh, Twelve members of city council were elected, and, and eleven of those were new. So you had a new city council, except for one, a new mayor with no municipal experience, 
And, um, and then for the first time in the city's history, the, um, the racial makeup of city council mirrored the city. So we had six African American members of city council and six white members of city council. And, um, so that created, you know, a lot of people just wondered how this was going to work and, um, and how we would get along. Um, and um, the concept I had of uh, just how to understand what we were going to do. Because for the community, this was, you know, this was a big change, certainly for the, for the, for the white community and the African American and um, what was going to happen, you know, from how a 32-year-old person in a essentially brand new city council uh, be able to deal with the challenges of the city. And, uh, and so I approached it this way. Because we had to open the governance of the city to everybody. And people who had never participated in it before. But what I knew was you didn't want anybody who had been had access to it to feel like they were told they had to go. So I pictured this that, uh, okay, you've got a table, and people been around that table of governance, and um, so what we're going to do, the table we're going to do, we're just going to bring more chairs around the table. So we're not telling you you've got to go. Just make room for some more people. And that, that, that was just the, the conceptual, that's how I saw it, so not to scare people away and, um, and make them feel like they had lost something to, to get them involved in the governance of the city and participation. We, um, next Thursday, we we'll have a great panel talking about Charleston Black and White and about uh, the civil rights movement and, and a lot of the work during the early time of my service, and we've got great people too. Uh, Bill Saunders, a big leader, he's a uh, Korean veteran. Um, Mr. Lewis Waring, a World War II veteran, African, all African Americans. Uh, Lucille Whipper, who was a member of the House of Representatives, and Cynthia McCartney Smith, a wonderful uh, woman who lives just about six blocks from here. And they will be able to bring, they will bring their um, members uh, which would be interesting to all of us in stemming from those years of, of segregation and Jim Crow and then their own respective roles in helping the city bridge that gap and bridge that um, challenge. Now, with that, uh, any questions so far or comments? I like questions. <laughs> I'm catching you by surprise. But in the course of this, if you want to ask something, you know, uh, go right ahead. So uh, we um, had to move the city forward. Um, the, not necessarily, you, you, you couldn't just work one thing at a time. But the issues facing the city were matters of crime and fear of crime. And um, things had, had been changing, including uh, a long time ago, um, police, a long time ago, a long time before I got elected, but, but there was, um, you know, uh, People were afraid of the police, and African Americans were afraid of the police. Um, the, a guy who served on city council, he's now deceased, Jerome Kinlock, who's my age, 
said that when he was growing up, his parents told him, you better be back in this neighborhood before dark. Or you going to get your butt kicked. Um, so, as, as things changed and as uh, in, in systems opened, uh, that <coughs> method of, of very harsh of control uh, no longer worked. And, um, and then society was changing. And um, so the uh, crime rate was going out across the board, not in any one neighborhood or the other. And um, you know, what is as bad as crime, and really worse, is the fear. Because statistically, you're not likely to be a victim. But if you're afraid of your neighborhood, and if you're afraid fear of yourself or your children, then that is debilitating to you and, uh, and into your neighborhood. So that was the first, I mean, that was a very important challenge to address. And um, we had a great police chief, uh, John Conroy, who the previous mayor had selected. And, and Conroy was a Marine and um, retired. And um, the city, the mayor had bad luck. His police chiefs, one left, I forget the reason, but what a great. And then you had a police chief who got, first of all, the paper had a picture of him filling up the swimming pool with the water from the fire hydrant, which he shouldn't do. And then when he kind of got over that, he and his son were caught. Um, trying to rob a store. So that's, you know, really kind of um, embarrassing for the police department. Obviously, he had to go, and uh, things were going downhill. And so the mayor, it's a very important lesson, the mayor had tremendous pressure to pick someone else from the police department and, uh, who was very light, you know, since when you get, a, you know, you need to bomb your point so and so. And he brought in this outside. And, um, and and that outsider, John Conroy, um, became a very important figure in Charleston's history. And, um, and he died tragically uh, young. But, um, but a very important lesson to in this job as mayor and in your job, whatever you have, is there is never any reason, justification to select somebody for a position other than you believe they are the best. And if ever you tempted to do it because people really like it if you did it, or because you know the father-in-law and he'd be really pleased or got some family connection or nothing illegal, but just, you know, other, you get other vibes, but, but that is, that is a, so damaging to your institution. And the best example I can give is this, which is easy to understand. If you're the football coach and you're picking a quarterback and you know that if you pick a certain quarterback, it's going to make somebody really happy and they're going to like you to give you a pat on the back and you know the family, the kid, and all like that. But he's not the best. Then your team is going to lose games. And the same way if you run any organization, there's a, get lots of pressure and hiring. There's no depth so prominent. The only I did was pick John Conroy. And, um, and then, not terribly long after he was the chief, maybe five, four years or so, there was a hospital strike that we will discuss probably at the next, the next meeting. And it was the, um, it was a, a level of unrest. The hospital workers were being unfairly treated. They were all African Americans who were protesting. They had a strike. Uh, at the Medical University, it was a long time ago, long, long time ago, it was in the 60s, 
And, um, and so lots of people from outside came, it became a major event, you know, and, uh, and, and lots of, you know, lots of uh, marches and, and the National Guard had to be called in and all of that. And, um, but, but Conroy had the respect of the African American community. He wasn't an old timer that would have ever been comfortable with any kind of treatment or attitude to people other than fairness. And because they trusted Conroy completely, and, and other people paid the ball, that the city was was able to avoid what so many southern cities would have seen in some kind of really riotous, out of cold situation that would have caused damage to the city for, for, for decades to come. So I inherited a very good man as the, the chief, um, but we didn't have any money. And when I got elected, you get elected, you know, you take off some 15 to December, the city budget's already passed. And there'd been no additional police. And, um, and then they were underpaid. And they, um, and um, we didn't have any college graduates. Uh, and, you know, the, the um, police profession, let me tell you, in two weeks we got a great plan on law enforcement. The current, Chief of Police, who's the best in the country, and, uh, and then former uh, Lieutenant Colonel Major Hetherington, who's first grade all star, and then the uh, head of the police executive research for the Shock Wexler, which is the, the, that's the entity that every police department and every police chief is a member of. This is, this is a national all star. So if there's ever a crime story in national paper, uh, they will go, you will see Chuck Wexler. Well, Chuck, like he, is, he is so, I got to know him, I'll explain that later in two weeks. But um, a really interesting panel on the, the, the issue over that broad sw swath of time of, of municipal law enforcement. And um, so anyway, we didn't have any money and, uh, and the police salaries were, um, were insufficient. There's nothing I can do about it back then. We, we did create team policing for the first time, which was John Conroy's idea, which, which was just to get the, the, the police out into the community. You know, getting out of their cars and, and decentralizing and, and trying to, to create more friendships and, and relationships between the citizens and the police department. And, um, and so the next year, we, um, I recommended increasing the pay of the police officers. The, the police officers, the five guys were paid the same. And um, so I increased the police officers and, and not, nothing in denigration of the five guys. You go to fire and you see those great, skilled, highly trained firefighters running into potential death, running into fire. It is the most inspiring amazing thing you can imagine. But but the but in leasing what happened in America, whether it was a knowledgeable in constitutional law or or psychology or whatever, it was it was a different profession. So I increased the recommend increasing the pay of the police officers, which wasn't popular. So the so this was the next year, and so that, so the fire department union picketed, and um, so it was a real controversial situation. Where, where did they pick it? Well, they picked it a lot of places, in fact, and they picked it at home. So, um, so my dear wife and young children, you know, it was a little disheartening on Christmas Day, you know, we go going to church and we have to go past the picket line <laughs> get in that car. But anyway, we um, then uh, then the fire the union chief, who was a good guy. He was a good guy. He just he just kind of got 
uh, whatever, and so he publicly criticized and fired you, insulted you, and said that he didn't have, which was a kind of a mixed uh, uh, terminology, but he said that he didn't have but an eighth grade high school education. Um, well, he was a high school graduate, but, but I, I can't, I wasn't allowed the member of the fire department to publicly criticize the fire chief on a personal matter. So we fired him. So then that occasioned a federal, a suit in federal court that, um, that we violated his freedom of speech and all that. And um, so we, we, we won the case. And, uh, and eventually, that the dear fellow, we you know, developed a pretty good relationship. The guy got fired, um, but it, but but that that helped begin the, the process of us, and then we added substantially to the numbers of our of police officers and the salaries, and we had to start beefing it up, and um, and so. Um, and I don't know if it's time to stop now. Do you think? Well, I'm thinking we have a couple minutes and then we're going to need to transition. But I wonder if um, what, what kind of questions or comments we might have from the, the group here. Yeah. Um, sir, uh, before you told the story about John Conroy, you talked about nepotism a little bit and only select the person that's best for the job. Um, I was wondering if you could shed your advice what happens when the best person for the job is related to you. How do you handle that as a leader? Well, you know, you, uh, of course, I've never had that happen, and, um, and I guess if it's, you know, there's some connections that are just too close. I mean, I think if it's your child or your spouse or something like that, you just, they just got to go find another, another job, you know, just too much. If there's a, but if there's some, you know, uh, relationship that isn't, so close that it would uh, destroy the community's confidence, then you, you pick the best person. And, and usually it's not something that clear. It's just you get you get caught and you feel torn. You know, somebody says, you know, Joe, Fred, I'm telling you, that, that is a finer son man and we've known him since he was he had a grasshopper and he would really be splendid whatever you're looking for, you know, and then the person who's telling you that you really like and they've always been supporting you. And so it's, it's usually grayer than that. And um, and then picking people is hard. It's very subjective. And um, but you, you just have to confront yourself with this question. Are you confident that the person that you're being asked to hire is really the best? Or is, it, or is it just going to be some feel good that you have, you know, in our you, know, you, you, you know, you just, you get burned if you don't pick the best person. Because as the mayor, I had 1,750 people working on me. And there was a lot of people. And uh, then I had, you know, great department heads and division heads. And, um, and you need any one of those people to be first -rate. You, just, you know, that's just the same way if you're in a, a, in a military unit and you're fighting a battle, you know, you, uh, you're, you know, if they're not first grade, you're going to be, you're going to be, yeah. Another question. Comments? I, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, as I'm thinking about our agenda over the course of the semester, we haven't really built in any time for you to talk about your Citadel experience. I'm wondering if you might, it, it uh, just offer a couple of uh, either you know just reflections on uh, the citadel and its importance for your um, you know, your, your formation. Well, uh, you know you um, the, the value of your citadel citadel experience you probably grows in appreciation of the years and uh, as as is life you, you just I mean, you just you, you, you see things more clearly you know at a distance. But um, I'll tell you, years ago, I was with this uh, very famous landscape architect that we were working with. And actually, he's going to, he was working on African American Museum, Walter Hood. He's African American. He was um, head of the landscape department at the University of California, Berkeley. He was commissioned to do projects in Europe and 
across America, much sought after speaker, and he had a department to run, you know, on the West Coast. And, um, and I mean, I'd see him at events, we'd be speaking together, and I, I once I said, Walter, how in the world do you do it all? And he said, well, Joe, just I have a lot of balls in the air, and I just make sure that I never let one drop. And, um, and I thought about, you know, the cynical experience that we, we don't understand or take for granted. But you, at a young age, have lots of balls in the air. You've got this, your classwork and the studies that relate to that. Um, you've got to keep, you've got your uniform. Uh, you've got your room. You've got your rifle. You've got drill. You've got a cadet under your responsibility as you become more senior in the school of holds, but all at the same time. And, and that is life. If you have a complex responsibility um, at any level, you, it's never, you can just do one thing at a time and say, well, that's all I'm working on. And so that's, that's, a, that's a signal of experience that you're having that you don't understand the value of. And, and there's many more, the, you know, the, the, the honor code and, uh, and then the bonding you have when you go through something difficult. I and mean, I've got, you know, guys that I was in, I mean, I finished class 64, we had started here in 1960, so that's a long time ago. And, um, and you just form something that is, uh, because you, you've gone through this cauldron of, of challenges and, um, so it's it's a great you know it's a great education and the value of which, as I said, will become even more apparent as you hope. I think we we do need to make the transition now and, and uh, I guess let the community in into our, our session here. But um, if you want to take uh, you know a five minute break uh, and uh, you know come on back and we'll we'll. Um, Restart in about 10 or 15, uh, 3.30 I think is the target.
guys didn't bargain for all this, but <laughs> well, yeah, nothing, no nothing we can do about it. It's interesting. You know, the public demanded it. There are going to be some sessions where we actually do what we do at Baker's Yeah, yeah. And this was, um, the outreach effort here was minimal. I mean, it was just putting out a few invites. Yeah. Oh, that's your best friend's grandma. Yeah, yeah. That'll be with us in two weeks. announcement before we um, uh, settle into our, our panel discussion. Um, if anyone uh, is in need of a um, assisted listening device, we've got two 
uh, located in the back. You can see Jeff has his hand up there. You can see Jeff about those. And as I understand it, the um, sound system, what it, it uh, it's directly connected to those. So see um, uh, see Jeff if you'd like to make use of one of the two um, uh, listening devices that we have. But um, that, uh, Mayor Riley. Well, um, thank you very much. Gary, Gary, Gary is a professor of history, is said, and is, um, uh, I worked with him last semester, uh, uh, participated in his, his classes about the, um, the South and uh, from the 60s forward. And, uh, and my great pleasure to have Gary helping me on this class. He's a great professor. I um, is a uh, most everyone here knows I'm a Citadel graduate. They're proud to be, and, um, and, and really so honored to be invited to come back home uh, to my alma mater and to have a chance to, to work with the, the faculty and the fine students that we have here. I look at some of my classmates and uh, friends, and, um, and I can tell you that the, the the Citadel is an even finer place than it was when we were there. Uh, the students are uh, most impressive. The, the faculty, I was, you know, I went to my office from the Capers Hall and just uh, chatting with the faculty members, what they're working on right now, what they're, what they're doing, and they're just all so impressive. And um, so it's wonderful to be back. And we're so grateful for the opportunity. And, um, and the chance to share what the citizens of Charleston gave me was these 40 years uh, of work in the most interesting time in our city's history, but in American history. All the, you know, the Charleston is, a, is a, a microcosm. When I was elected, a microcosm of urban America. And so all, the, all that was going on in urban America, in our country, was going on here, usually at a smaller scale, but, but complex matters of changes in the city, the city and society, uh, and, and all of that, and um, and the you know lessons of history. And I, I gave the students this wonderful quote, one of my favorite quotes, Harry Truman: uh, "Not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers." And, um, and, you know, Harry Truman got as far as the eighth grade. He was self-educated. But, uh, but the point is, let's not encourage them, encourage to, to always be readers and be readers of history and biography because history <coughs> isn't what we tend to think of, whether we're in drama school, maybe in high school, is the importance of the memorization of dates and places and facts and figures and all like that. And history rather is a study and understanding about how human beings, through their action or inaction, make things happen or not happen. It's about it's about leadership, and and so the, the, so I feel that our experiences that you've enabled me to have here are specific in what we did, but uh, in, in terms of those who work and in the community, how we responded, how we made things happen uh, is, is quite instructive. Am I doing something the right? The microphone has fallen down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's because I talk with my hands so much. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. Um, there we go. Does that mean I have to repeat everything I said? <laughs> no. uh, my dear friend Bill Moody, a colleague of city council, quickly, who's had difficulty of having to sit and listen to me a lot, quickly shook his head no, but I did not. <laughs> so, uh, so in this course, we will be dealing with a series of issues that the city and, um, and really got a great group of, of uh, panelists to be participating with us and, uh, and a wonderful swath of history uh, to, to consider. And uh, the, uh, the coming attraction next week 
we have a, a, the subject is uh, Charleston, uh, black and white, about race, matters of racial progress. And, um, and we've got Bill Saunders, locals know, a uh, great leader, uh, uh, council member, former council member Lewis Waring, Keith Waring's dad, both veterans, uh, and um, then uh, um, Lucille Whipper, former member of the legislature, and Cynthia McCartney Smith, a wonderful civic leader. And um, so rich, rich history and, and experiences that they can bring. And then the next class will come back in this room on law enforcement and police is uh, Chief Melvin, the best police chief in the country. Nat Heddington, who's um, uh, one of his, uh, there's a connection with Nat here in the class. And um, he worked with Chief Greenberg and the fabulous man with the police department. And then we've got Chuck Wexler, who's the uh, chief executive or uh, director of the police uh, Research Education Research Forum, which sounds uh, kind of complicated, but it's an entity that police chiefs uh, members up. It's the police chiefs organization, and, and that's the cutting edge law enforcement group in the country. If there's ever, if there's a, a crime story in, in, in a national newspaper, you will see Chuck Waxler quoted, so Chuck is agreed to come, so that's going to be great. And then not long after that, we've got David McCullough. Village Prize winning historian will be speaking, and he will be at Bond Hall, and uh, he's very excited about coming. And I think he's going to be talking about, I don't know if he's squared the way with him to say publicly, but um, he's working on a new book, and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and it's about the, the pioneers of the, um, of the Northwest Territory, but historians know that was was Indiana, once was Indiana and Ohio and Illinois. And uh, so I talked to David about that and he's so excited. He never, he never writes a book about something that he knew a lot about. Rather, he, he goes on an exploratory mission and, and then he studies something and learns. We said he found this treasure trove, which he will probably tell you about. And I think Marietta College in Ohio, all these journals and diaries, of these, uh, of these pioneers. And uh, so anyway, we've got great uh, uh, group for the kids, but nothing better than what you're going to hear this afternoon, except the part you hear from me, which isn't going to be all uh, good. So um, uh, we've got uh, with us today uh, Don Fowler, uh, who's a friend of very long standing. And um, Don, uh, was former national chairman of the Democratic National Committee, chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. Um, he earned his undergraduate degree at Wofford, where he had uh, the unusual joint distinction of having his basketball jersey retired and president of the student body. He's a master's and PhD in political science from the University of Kentucky. He's a nationally respected political uh, consultant, and um, uh, he's a retired colonel of the Army Reserve, graduate of the Army War College, and also been a uh, uh, much beloved professor at Carolina, and also comes down to the Citadel campus once a week to teach our cadets. So an all-star guy and, and a great man. And then Kate Bar, who I'm proud to say is my best friend in life, and we knew each other at the Sizzle. He was a year ahead of me, class of 63, and then a year ahead of me in law school. And um, in Capers, Huck, Nickney, um, and Ellen, Allie married after he graduated from Sizzle. So he was in law school, was married uh, a year before I got there, and I was single. But, um, but I had, had uh, after my first year in law school, met uh, Charlotte, now my wife, actually on the Citadel campus at the graduation. And um, so what I would do is during the week, you know, I would just happen over to Huck and Ellie's house, just looking sad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Joe, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing all right. What are you doing this week? And I said, well, you know, I Hope and Charlotte would come up when she just doesn't have a place to stay. And uh, they said, Why don't you go to stay with us? Well, I said, That'd be great. So, you know, <laughs> they would 
take care of her and allow me to have the joy of having her with me. And then when uh, Huck, after law school, had his uh, responsibilities in the Army and served uh, us uh, in Vietnam, and then our wives started chatting and they thought, said, you know, you really ought to see if Huck would like to come practice law with you. Well, I just had this one person law office and I didn't know that was much off anybody. And um, when I sent Huck a letter in Vietnam, a copy of what she has, and um, telling him that I would love to have him join me in practice of law. So I had the pleasure of practice of law with, with Huck and Capers, and, um, and then he uh, was my campaign manager every time I ran for mayor and for governor. And, um, and then he served uh, our community as the uh, Ninth Circuit Solicitor, State Prosecuting Official for uh, Charleston and Berkeley County, and is a very beloved, distinguished lawyer and leader in, in the bar. So um, let me just talk for a minute about how I got into this and um, the business of mayor. And then we'll, I'll call on um, Don, maybe, and then talk to that, if that works. And, um, and, and so now my students are going to, as we go through this, have a misfortune or the experience of something that many of you have had, and that is you have to hear me say something twice. And um, so a little bit of this, I might have gone over in the first part of this, but anyway, they are very, look like they're very patient people and will understand. Um, but um, I had never thought of being Mayor Charleston. I've never been to a city council meeting, never aspired to be mayor. I was in the state legislature, loved that service, interested in state government. And, um, but after six years, Charlotte said, you need to be home. And I retired from the legislature and was urged to run for mayor in 1975. And the reason I, the primary reason I did, and was the, the felt need for the community to build bridges between the African-American and the white community. And, uh, you know, late 60s and early 70s was a very, 70, very turbulent time in our country in, in matters of racial progress. And, uh, and many southern cities were, were stumbling and, uh, and, and falling in that effort and the resultant um, damage to, to the community was was, was most unfortunate. And um, so uh, African American leadership and white leadership uh, urged me to run for mayor. And, um, and I did, and I did for that primary reason. I had been in the legislature and said, and, the, and there, you know, you don't run anything. And um, so I had no notion of the complexity of the job, you know. I, you make speeches and propose laws. And uh, so I told Charlotte that I was going to, she said, are you going to run for mayor? And I said, well, honey, I've been urged to. I really feel like I should. But I said, I'm only going to serve one term. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're still married 50 years last summer. But anyway, I didn't know that it would be so complex and, and interesting and also that the challenges were were required uh, long periods of work and, and many efforts at, at finding um, solutions. So the, um, the main challenges facing the city were racial progress, and we'll really probably say that substantially for next week. Um, crime, Great fear of crime and the crime rate had gone up. Uh, Peter Hart, who did our polling, he was a, you know, the best pollster in America and still is a consultant. And as Jeff Karen did our polling, he was part of Peter's firm. But, um, and you, you, you do polls to get to understand the challenges of election. Do not ever use polls to go. That to kill them. I knew better than that. You see a lot of politics that are killed. That, that, that removes leadership. And you're nervous, what's the polls say? But you can propose to help you understand what's going on. You can campaign. And Peter Hart said, when I ran free election, 
because it, you know, it's like turning a big ship. You can't reverse things overnight. So we've been working on it. But it said the fear of crime in the northwest section of Charleston, this would have been in the late 70s, was greater than any part of any city in America had ever called including Detroit and places and places like that. And so so, so dealing with that and the, and the challenges of that, which we might get into somewhat uh, tonight, and then um, then the decline of King Street, the Central Business District, which was happening in every Ameri in every American city. And um, and it was one of those things that happened so gradually that you didn't understand what was happening uh, or why, or how to address it. It was just, you know, when I was growing up as a child, that was that was the shopping center of course, South Carolina. There were no shopping centers. That was it. You came from wherever. And then the Saturday before Christmas, when after I got elected, I went to King Street, you know, the day before Christmas, Christmas Eve, and um, and pulled in behind Leggington's and uh, Lady Hughley's, parked my car and got out on the King Street and there was nobody there. So just in less than a decade, it had shrunk. So, so, so dealing, dealing with that, um, uh, the, the challenge of the, the city's declining tax base and population. When I was, the city had a population of 71,000. We later saw the subsequent census that in 1975, when I was elected, the city population had shrunk to 57,000 people. And, and that's, a, it's, it's nothing about, you know, value, right, size, or anything like that. A center city of a metropolitan area needs to have energy and resources of people and tax base because a metropolitan area depends upon it for a whole lot of things. It depends on it for the arts. It depends on it for civic activity. It depends on it for safety. It, it depends on it for pride. And uh, so that was to, to rebuilding that and getting the city's tax base up and physical strength. So lots of interesting and challenging stories. And then I had gone from uh, being a, then a legislator, which is, you know, you're not, I mean, people know you and, and all that, but you're not running anything. So you're not, you know, the one person responsible for something. You know, you have a role in it. So, so I got elected the um, 9th of December, and we took office on the 15th of December, which is odd. There's a historic reason for that, but we really changed. That's kind of weird, like the coup d'etat. And um, so I take office on the 15th of December, and um, you know, never been to city council meeting and all that. And um, so Christmas Eve, I'm there. Uh, the boys have gone to bed and putting together whatever complicated toy, I was with, <laughs> you know, it was whatever, it was a rocking horse or something, the boys were little, and you know, it's late and you're really tired, and then the, there's one part that doesn't quite fit, you know, or it falls off, and then you're screwing it on, and then you cut your finger, you know, and everything, and it's really not going great. Right. And then the phone rings. And so I pick up the phone, and this lady says, Mayor Rogers, and yes, ma'am. She said, I'm, I'm so and so. She said, You know, there are not enough Christmas lights on King Street this year. <laughs> and I said, Oh, well, I said, You know, Ms. so and so, I just took office just a week and a half ago, and really we hadn't had time, but I'm telling you what, we'll get to work on that, so there'll be plenty of lights for King Street next year. You know, and so Charlotte was observing this and kind of amazed my patience, you know, the finger bleeding and everything is late and all that. And um, so I hung up the phone and got the thing put together. And then about 3.20 in the morning, the phone rings. And um, I mean, I turn on the light to see what time it is and pick up the phone. You already borrowed something happens to someone you love. And this guy comes on the phone, he said, uh, is this Mayor Rye? I said, yeah. He said, I'm Colonel so-and-so. And I said, oh, I'm Colonel. He said, um, you know, he said, I'm, I'm, I was calling for you. I couldn't vote for you because I live in that plaza. 
And when he told me his name, I don't, it seemed like I would see his name on letters to the editor that didn't look like somebody who would vote for me anyway. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, he said, look, um, Mayor Alley, we, our power is out here in Mount Pleasant, and we have the phone number to have the power company. <laughs> So I said, Colonel, now let me get this straight. It is 3.20 and it is uh, Christmas morning and you called me to find out the phone number of the head of the power company. You said, that's right. And I said, find out for your own damn self. <laughs> so, so my wife saw this amazing change in this position. And I said, and that's a, a few hours. So anyway, um, the job of mayor was very interesting for a whole host of reasons. So what I'm now going to do is, um, is call on Don. And Don, thank you for coming down from Columbia. And thank you for your friendship. He's been a friend and a mentor and just a, just a class act and uh, the finest um, qualities you would want from somebody interested in the, the political life of the community of the state or a country. And um, so thank you for coming in and I'll sit down and join your home. Let's give you a Mayor Riley, uh, Baker's Bar, my old friend, and I see a number of other friends here in the audience. I'm delighted to be here to share this, this afternoon with you. Uh, before I get into what I want to say, I, this is not just a compliment. It's the literal truth, but it certainly is a compliment. I have, in my lifetime, traveled all over the United States. And anywhere you go, from Los Angeles to Boston, to Minneapolis to Dallas, if you meet a mayor and they know you're from South Carolina, they want to know, do you know Joe Riley? He's the best mayor in America. And that's, that's not no deal. <laughs> That's absolutely the truth. Now, when Kerry called and told me that he would like for me to come down and talk to you uh, for a few minutes about the politics of 1974, uh, national politics and uh, state politics, and of course that was the year when a lot of stuff happened, which I'll get to in a minute, but it led up to Mayor Riley's first election in 75. And the world was different then, and the tumult that happened uh, both nationally and here in South Carolina in 74 uh, was a background, was, was a context in which uh, South Carolina desperately needed new leadership. Um, and uh, one of the leaders that we selected, that you selected here in Charleston, was Joe Riley, and I can tell you, you did a wonderful job then and he has been the best mayor in America for the last 40 years, and you should be proud of that and give him another hand. <laughs> now, when Kerry told me 1974, uh, the first thing I thought about was Nixon's resignation, and the second thing I thought, thought about was the first time we elected a Republican governor here in South Carolina, both in 1974. So that's not a year that I want to spend a lot of time on. <laughs> but I will try and uh, try to get through with this to give you some context without getting tied up in too many details. Uh, you all know that um, in 1972, uh, President Nixon was reelected. You might not remember this, but you know it anyway. That was the year in which the police caught these plumbers, these burglars breaking into the office of the Democratic National Committee in Washington. And that set in motion a whole series of actions and denials and investigations and on and on so that in the beginning of 1974, after many, many uh, congressional hearings and legal proceedings uh, before congressional committees, and in other circumstance that put a really 
dull light on uh, President Nixon's administration. It got down to the point, and I don't have time to go through all the details, but it got down to the point of determining whether or not President Nixon knew about the break-ins before they happened and whether or not he consented to those break-ins. Uh, there were multiple investigations by all sorts of, of uh, officials in Washington. Uh, it was the number one news item for two years. Uh, it finally came down to a question that was presented to a special committee appointed uh, by the Senate, the Sam Irwin Committee, that was charged with the responsibility of looking through all that happened in the Watergate break-in and uh, whether who was involved and who authorized it. And it, it, it ultimately came to the point of trying to find out if President Nixon knew about it before it happened. Now, before I get to that point, and I'll try to get there very quickly, I was a new Democratic State Chair in South Carolina then. And almost nobody knows this, but the only office that they, that, that the burglars, the plumbers so-called, actually penetrated, they went there to put taps on telephones the only phone they tapped was in the office that state chairs used. The only one. The way they caught the burglars were that one of them was that one of them put a piece of paper to, to keep the door open so it wouldn't lock on them, and they didn't take that piece of paper out. You know what I'm talking about. You put a piece of paper in the door like that, and you lock it so that the bolt won't close. And when the janitors came in the next day, they found that, and that precipitated what took place subsequently over the next two years. So the only phone on which there was a bug was with the state chairs. And ultimately, there were eight of us state chairs who sued the committee to re-elect the president. <laughs> and we did, and it took four years, but we got a million dollars out of the committee. <laughs> That's a little personal note. We gave all that money to the party, but it was a, an interesting personal experience. The question of whether or not the president knew about this was the all-consuming political factor uh, during that spring and summer of 1974. And finally, there was a guy called in, nobody had ever heard of, his name was Alexander Butterfield. It turned out that he was a substantial clerical staff person in the White House. And they, I don't know who called him, I never have learned that. But what he testified to that nobody else had, and they had, they, they had that, all of the principal staff people in the White House to testify before the Sam Irving Committee. And one other thing I'll mention to you about the Sam Irving Committee, it was the most popular TV show, I think, in the world. People would take off work, would take leave, so they could go home and watch the proceedings of the Irving Committee. And it was a big, big deal. Well, this guy, Ed Alexander Butterfield, came after all these others, and he sort of calmly commented, Mr. Mayor, that President Nixon had recorded all conversations that he had ever had in the White House. And, uh, <laughs> and, and somehow nobody had ever mentioned that. Well, then there proceeded a lot of legal actions that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the question was whether the president had to turn over the recordings of his conversations to this committee. And the Supreme Court said yes. And the president did. And there were a lot of other things that <coughs> took place, but that conclusively uh, substantiated the notion, the fact <coughs> that President Nixon did in fact know about the break-in and had at least intuitively or implicitly, is the right word, implicitly, given his correct, his, his consent. Well, that was what the Irwin Committee was trying to find out, and they found it. Uh, 
the actions then went to the U.S. House of Representatives, and the question was whether they would um, whether they would impeach the president. And the Judiciary Committee in the House that has jurisdiction over this passed a resolution of uh, ordering or, I guess, uh, permitting uh, the impeachment. And that was passed subsequently by the whole House. And then it was sent over to the Senate. Before it was acted on by the Senate, President Nixon uh, resigned. He resigned on, I think, the 20, I mean, I had it written down here. He resigned on uh, the 9th of August, 1974. Uh, that, I have to back up now to deal with the politics of this. In 1968 and in 1970, Democrats lost very badly. Uh, President Nixon won in 68. We lost many House seats. We lost many Senate seats. We lost governor, gubernatorial seats. Uh, 68 and uh, 70 and 72 were really bad years for Democrats. Now we come up essentially three months, two months before the general election in 74 when we were, we thought, going to lose again. But the Watergate experience with all of the publicity and all of the negative reaction about President Nixon and a lot of it flowed off onto uh, Republicans generally. And 74 was a huge victory for Democrats all over the America. We picked up House seats, Senate seats, gubernatorial seats, legislative <coughs> seats. We, we won everywhere, everywhere in America except South Carolina. <laughs> uh, this is almost as uh, unbelievable or as uh, taxing as, uh, as the, the, the impeachment. Uh, South Carolina politics then was much more genteel and uh, much more certain than it is now. Um, and everybody, including me, uh, everybody thought that either Brian Dorn um, or Brantley Harvey would get elected governor. Brantley Harvey was a lieutenant governor. Brian Dorn had been in Congress for 20 years. And people thought he should stay up there, but he wanted to come <coughs> home. And um, it wasn't Brantley Harvey. Earl Morris. 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 <laughs> no, it's Brian Dorn. It was Brian and Earl. After Brian and Earl, and then everybody. Was, yes, I, I apologize. Yeah. Everybody thought it would be Earl Morris who was who was the lieutenant governor, or Brian Dorn, who was congressman, and uh, there were three or four other people ran in the primary. And then all of a sudden, this word came from Charleston that Pug Ravenel was going to run. <laughs> Who the hell is Pug Ravenel? <laughs> Excuse my French. Um, well, Pug registered. Uh, he paid his fees. He ran in the primary. It was disclosed during the primary campaign that Pug a native Charlestonian had gone to Harvard, to Wall Street, and he didn't come back to South Carolina until 71 or 72. And there's a provision in our state constitution that in order to be elected governor, you must have been a citizen, a resident of South Carolina for five years immediately preceding the election. Well, he left when he was a teenager and came back three years before the election. There was a court proceeding in April of that year, and the judge said, that's not a bar to running for governor under these circumstances. Um, judge Grimble. And so Pug continued to run, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Pug and Brian Dorn were the two highest vote-getters, not Earl Morris, 
And so they were put in the Democratic primary, Earl, I mean, uh, Brian Dorn and uh, Pug Ravenel, and Pug won. Pug was the Democratic nominee. Well, there was a friction between the Pug Ravenel people, who were mostly young, and the Brian Dorn people, who were mostly old, uh, and the, 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 the competition, the feelings between those two groups uh, was just not nice at all. It was really bitter. And I was the state chair then, and I was right in the middle of that. And I want to tell you, that's one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had. Well, on the other side, the Republican side, who nobody thought about, um, General Westmoreland, a native of South Carolina, a student here at the Citadel, um, Chief of Staff of the United States Army and Commander of Troops in Vietnam, William Westmoreland, was going to run as a Republican. Well, that, you know, that solved that question. That just determined who the Republican nominee would be. Except there was a new state senator from Charleston in the state senate named Jim Edwards, who said, oh, well, I think I'll run. And somebody <laughs> said, oh, well, how dumb you are running against Westmoreland. Well, as you all know, uh, Dr. Edwards did, in fact, uh, win that Republican primary. And he was put in a golden position with all the trouble over in the Democratic Party. Uh, unrest about Pug and about Brian. But the end point had not been reached. There was a court proceeding before the primary. There was another court proceeding after the primary challenging Pug's right to run because he had not been a resident here for five years. That proceeding was heard before the state Supreme Court in the middle of September in 1915. 74, and on the same day that they heard the argument unanimously, the, the South Carolina uh, Supreme Court said, no, Pug Ravenel is not eligible to run. So that left the Democratic Party uh, without a candidate against Dr. Edwards. Uh, now that was seven weeks before the primary, uh, before the general election. How do you get a candidate in seven weeks? You can't hold a primary. The state committee could have done it, maybe, but that didn't seem to be the political best option, so we recalled the state convention. And we had the state convention, and the state convention nominated Brian Dorn, who came in second in the primary. Well, I love Brian Dorn, I always will, but he was the worst candidate in the world <laughs> during those seven weeks. And lo and behold, much to everybody's surprise, Dr. Edwards won. And that was the first Republican in South Carolina in the 20th century. So in one year, the year before Mayor Riley was elected, we had a presidential resignation and the first Republican elected to govern South Carolina. So that set up a good uh, year for 1975. <laughs> Thank you, John. That's a hard act to follow. I've, um, I've looked carefully and taken measure across the broad audience. And, um, Joe, I think it's time. We really, this is really not a class, this is a press conference. We're announcing the <laughs> four rise ready for mayor three years ago. <laughs> um, I, I feel somewhat intimidated because uh, originally Robert Rosen, who is a, an eminent local historian and lawyer, was going to be on this panel as well. And I expected that I would go third and that I would simply say me too to what Don and Robert had to say, but Robert uh, had uh, a, a schedule otherwise. Um, so I, I, I was asked to talk about Charleston in 1975, and I thought, hell, I can't remember what happened last week. How am I going to remember? 
what happened in 1975. And he just thinks a long time ago. So I made some, I talked to Robert and he gave me some stuff. And uh, I called my friend uh, Mike Duffy, I think Mike, yeah, District Judge, United State District Judge Mike Duffy, class of 65, gentlemen. And so Mike and I uh, talked, and we couldn't remember either what happened <laughs> in 1965. But I understand that the, that the uh, Ryan Hicks book is assigned to the class. Well, if you haven't yet, you're going to read uh, about uh, a character, and I use the word liberally, uh, uh, in that book whose name is Bill Regan. Bill, Bill Regan was Mayor Riley's longtime uh, city attorney, a, a brilliant lawyer. A, a raconteur par excellence. And so I really regretted that Bill Regan wasn't around for me to call. Not that Bill would remember either. <laughs> but I knew that Bill could come up some, with some real good stories. <laughs> and uh, so, that having been said, uh, earlier in the class, when Mary Riley was speaking to you gentlemen in the class, he used the metaphor of the ark, which I love, the ark of justice, the ark of history. And I, 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 when I was actually asked to talk about 1975, and so I thought about that in terms of what, was the, what were the events that culminated in uh, Mayor Riley's uh, uh, announcement for his election in, in 1975. In a manner of speaking, you could go f as far back as the constitutional Convention of 1788. I'm not going to do that, but but just to, to the extent that social justice played so great a part, as you heard when the mayor talked to you earlier, in in his reasons for running, it was the, I guess you might say, back in those days, the avoidance of it by deferring the slavery question back then. But predating 1975, there were some seminal events, seminal events both nationally. And here in Charleston, that led to to that uh, to the mayor's announcement in '75. On, on a broader scale, there was, of course, the, the 1954 decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The mayor preceding Mayor Riley was J. Palmer Gilliard. Uh, mayor Gilliard took office in 1959. I'll I'll take an aside with the cadets here. That was the year that I came in as a knob, in, uh, in, in the fall of 1959. Those were the days before air conditioning, fellas. And it, it is true that we slept with all the windows and doors open. Obviously, there was no air conditioning. And it's also true that there was a lion in the zoo in Hampton Park and we had a roar at night. That's not something, that's not something that Pat Conroy made up. It really is true. And the, there was also a train that came barreling through the campus between Latillier Hall and the track. That strip, there was an actual train, and that freight train would come woo-woo. And so imagine this. You're, you're, this is hell night. Okay, hell night. And you've just been finally put to bed. Your windows are open, and here you hear a damn lion roaring. <laughs> and then this train comes roaring through. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a miracle that as many of us stayed as, as did. But that was... That was the episode. That was my digression, greater audience, so for the benefit of the of the guests. So in 1959, Palmer was elected to replace William G. Morrison, who had, I don't know how long he'd been in office. And, and Palmer served from 59 until until there was an interim mayor in, in, in 75, and I'll talk about that just very briefly before Mayor Riley uh, announced and was elected. Well, the 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 arc that we speak of that culminated in Mayor Riley's running uh, was truly one of, of social justice. And I'm, I will submit that it's never ending and is still not ending. And it's a, it's, it's a, to switch metaphors, it's, it's a drumbeat that should never cease. Um, in, in, um, in 1963, now I'll just pick up some, some seminal points, I think, in, in state and local history. In 1963, the governor was Fritz Hollings, Central graduate, I think class of 43, he went on to become our United States Senator. In 1963, uh, uh, Fritz Hollings was very instrumental in, in the admission of Harvey Gant to uh, Clemson University, first, uh, first African-American to, to 
be admitted to any state institution, to my memory, to my recollection in the state. In 1963, there was a, a movement in Charleston called the Charleston Movement. It was inspired by local <coughs> civil rights leaders, um, uh, James Blake, Mark James Frazier, Herbert Fielding, Reverend Ida Quincy Newman, to mention Reverend Newman, by the way, Reverend Newman's grandson was the circuit judge who presided over the recent prosecution of the police officer in North Charleston, Slager, that resulted in the mistrial. If you talk about connectivity there. But to go on. So 60, in 63, the Charleston movement was involved in protests um, here, here in the city. There were lunch counter sit-ins. There, there were marches in the street. Uh, the governor was called upon to send the highway patrol down to, uh, to ensure peace, sent about 180 highway patrolmen down to, to secure the, the, uh, the peace. Finally, uh, a, a, a settlement of sorts was negotiated by Mayor Galliard and King Street merchants who agreed to some fairly simple things that, as we think of them here today, but by describing what they are, you can understand what the demands were at the time to provide equal employment to desegregate customer services, to use courtesy titles in conversation, and to serve everybody who came into the store. We take those things for granted here today, but those were results accomplished by protest in 1963. It operated to diffuse the demonstrators, and you'll certainly hear from more speakers in the in the sequence of the mayor's presentations to come. I know that Bill, Bill Saunders, um, I think, was probably one of those involved in many of these things that I'll talk about and can speak firsthand to it. Um, so, <clears throat> Neil Gilliard was very much old school, but he was persuaded by a number of of more progressive leaders. Uh, Gedney Howe was a, a prominent Charleston lawyer who had also served as circuit solicitor. His longtime city attorney was Morris Rosen, who, uh, Morris Rosen is the father of the Robert Rosen, who was the no-show today, which means I had to talk, and I was, because I was gonna ride his, his coattails, but Morris Rosen was a very distinguished lawyer. Um, in, in the, in the Gilliard administration, during the Gilliard administration, uh, they, did, uh, they did appoint an African-American to the municipal court bench, uh, Judge Richard E. Fields. Uh, judge Fields went on to become a family court judge and an esteemed circuit court judge in, in the state. Um, and perhaps Gilliard's greatest accomplishment was in annexing uh, uh, outside of the peninsula city. He annexed, uh, he, and he probably doubled, if not greater, uh, grew the, the geographic size of the city of Charleston during his term. And that, of, serve, of course, served to enlarge the city, but it also served to dilute the African-American vote. I'm, I'm not suggesting that was the motive for it, but because one of the things that was happening during, these, during the 60s was the, the, the exodus of, 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 of white people from the peninsula out to the, to the, uh, um, to the suburbs. Um, another culminating event occurred in 1969, March of 1969. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll digress for just a minute. I, I got out of the Army in uh, January of 1969 and joined Mayor Riley at, as his law partner at 13 Broad Street. Um, we were a partner of two, and we had one staff person, Charlotte, his wife. She was our secretary. I remember getting back to Bill Regan. Bill Regan used to love to tell the story sometime later that Joe Riley got his secretary pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> What, what the bad thing about that was, a lot of people who heard it did not know that I was married by family. And it took me years to overcome that. In March of 
Colossians 69, um, who was the leader of the strike? The, uh, Mary Moultrie. Mary Moultrie was a, a worker at either the, the Charleston County Hospital or the medical, what was then, what was now the Medical University of South Carolina. And, and she wanted for herself and her fellow workers an increase to $1.30 an hour, which was denied. And they organized, and they protested. They protested, they, the hospital workers protested, and they went into a strike, wanting a dollar thirty, a raise of $1.30 an hour. And it escalated. It grew. It attracted national attention. Um, Martin Luther King, if you remember your history, had been assassinated the year before, but his widow, Coretta Scott King, came down in March. Ralph, Ralph Abernathy, who was another national civil rights leader, came down in, in, in March. Um, it, it, it drew national attention to Charleston. 900 demonstrators were arrested. How they ever processed that many, I, I, I'll never say. I will, another segue. When, when I took office as a solicitor in January of 1977, my predecessor had been Bob Wallace, and until 77, solicitors, prosecutors in South Carolina were all part-time. I'd been an assistant, and so we had private practices, and we would prosecute part-time, and then have our own private practices, couldn't do any criminal defense work. So when I took office, I went to the desk that Bob always used, and I just remember this vividly. I opened up the center drawer, and there were, it was not unusual, but there were these arrest warrants in old arrest warrants, and one of the arrest warrants was charging Ralph Abernathy with, 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 um, with disorderly conduct. And, and uh, that's what happened to the prosecution of Ralph Abernathy. His warrant ended up just left in the, in the drawer of the prosecutor, which I submit was substantial justice. 900, 900 demonstrators were arrested. Uh, the, the, that I'm not going to talk a, a whole lot more about that because I know that Bill Saunders will. Bill Saunders was very instrumental in negotiating a settlement of that dispute. But all of this comprises this arc that I'm describing. It's going to lead to, to 1975. Um, in the 70s, by the 70s, all of the cities, the inner cities schools had become all black. Um, 1970 was also a, a, a year of great significance because Herbert Fielding, an African-American civil rights leader who had rubbed shoulders with Jay Waitis Waring, I hope you'll study about him, and uh, Thurgood Marshall, I hope you'll study about him if you don't know who he is. Um, Herbert Fielding was elected to the State House of Representatives. <coughs> Now, Mayor Riley had been arrest, uh, uh, elected. <laughs> <laughs> had, been, had been elected to um, to the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives, in uh, in, the, in November of 1968. And he, had, he he talked about writing me in Vietnam, and he uh, he sent me one of his bumper stickers. And I, I put it on my Jeep and took a picture of it and sent it back to Joe, but he was afraid he would get me in trouble if he published that. I hope that, that would not have been the case. But the point being that Joe, Mayor Riley, was in the State House of Representatives in 1968. Um, when, when, uh, when the elections for the State House occurred in, in, uh, in two years later, uh, Herbert, who had run in 68, ran again. Um, and the, 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 by then I was back in, in Charleston. And uh, the, uh, the, at that time, all House members were elected in a pack. We had 11 House members from Charleston. There were no um, single member districts. And so the top 11 were the, the, the representatives who were elected. Um, and in that year, in, uh, of 1970, um, 
Herbert Fielding ran, Jim Clyburn, who is now our uh, uh, congressman, ran. Um, and both Jim and Herbert were nominated in the Democratic primary. Up until then, the Democratic primary was in South Carolina that was really the election. There was not much of a Republican Party. However, there was substantial uh, opposition in the general election in 1970. Um, the running in a team, uh, the Democratic candidates for House ran under the umbrella of what was what they call the Democratic Action Team. As I think, I guess, Gordon Stein was the chairman of the county party. And so funds were collected for the team to run. And then they were allocated out to the, to the candidates and they could use it to fund their own campaigns as it were. Uh, you'll, you'll hear Jim Clyburn speak of this often. And Herbert Fielding spoke of it often before his death. But Mayor Riley took his, his share of that pot and gave it to Herbert and Jim in, in 1970 and said, look, you guys need this better than I do. I don't think I'm going to have any problem getting in. Uh, I want you to use my share of the funds. And in the election, the general election of 1970, Herbert Fielding was elected to the State House first time since Reconstruction and African American had been elected to the State House along with, I think, I.S. Levy Johnson in Columbia and uh, and Felder from Tom, Tom Felder. Is he from Columbia? From Columbia too. Now this is a part of the arc I'm talking about because Mayor Riley's um, involvement in the, in the State House have a great deal to do with this. And I'll come back to that. Um, I told you that that, um, uh, that Mayor Gilliard, who was Mayor Riley's pre really predecessor, was somewhat old school, he was primarily unopposed in his first several elections. However, in 1971, he was opposed by a lawyer, uh, Bill Ackerman, who was a, a lawyer and a businessman. Bill Ackerman uh, developed South Windermere Shopping Center, if you happen to know where that is, uh, and, and he did other business ventures. He was also a very successful lawyer. He was a very progressive thinker, and the 1971 election between Ackerman and, and Gilliard was hot, and it was very, very nasty. The vote was 7,655 to 7,564, 90, 91 votes. There was a contested breakout. Gilliard was confirmed. Um, Gilliard then was opposed in the general election by Arthur Ravenel, for whom the bridge is named. Um, and Gilliard won that by 9,046 votes to 8,221, uh, a hotly contested election. Um, when I spoke to Robert Rosen, he told me he thought that Gilliard saw that the, right, the, the, right, the handwriting was on the wall. Um, that uh, ordinary, that term would have run from 71 to 75, and um, Gilliard resigned in August of 75 to be appointed as the deputy assistant to the United States to the Navy for reserve affairs, and um, uh, a city councilman, Arthur Shermer, Arthur Bro Shermer, was appointed as the interim mayor, and so Bro Shermer was the immediate mayor when when Mayor Riley. Um, Robert did, did feed me an interesting anecdote. Um, <coughs> one, of the, one of the differences in the 1975 election when Mayor Riley ran and preceding elections was in the, in, the, in the older days, in the old days prior to 75, the mayor ran and typically would want, run with a slate of aldermen called at the time. So the mayor would select aldermen and they'd run as a, as a slate, as a team. Uh, probably as a result of uh, inquiries from the Justice Department, I don't quite remember the details of that history, but to make that longer explanation shorter, 
the, uh, the city adopted the single member district form of electing council members for the 1975 election. Um, Robert Rosen tells me an interesting story about that. First of all, I told you about Palmer Gilliard appointing Richard Fields, an African American, to the municipal court. And I, I think he was encouraged to do that by uh, Kenny Howe and, and, and by Marsh Rosen and by other civic leaders. It was time to allow an African American to have a significant role in city government. Uh, Robert said that, uh, that Palmer was very much concerned about uh, a, a, a black man sentencing white people to jail. And that's, that was the vernacular at the time. Unpleasant for us to think of today, but Palmer was old school. And that Palmer, was an, Palmer was a decent man, but that was what, that was a part of Palmer's heritage. It was a part of the old school that was no more by then. Morris Rosen, Robert's father, though, was charged with the task of drawing up the single member districts for 12 seats. And Palmer said, now, Morris, I want to make sure that it comes out seven to five. And that is that we'll end up with seven white council members and five <coughs> black council members. So Morris drew up the line. The elections were held. Well, what was um, Arthur Christopher's seat, Joe? Um, the, the number? It was up in the north and yeah, east yeah. section. Yeah. Arthur Christopher ended up being elected. Arthur Christopher was elected from the area, from the city council district north of the Citadel, Citadel up, Upper Rutledge Avenue there. And for that seat, although there was an expectation by the drafters that it would be filled by a white candidate. The candidates were a white lawyer whose name was uh, Ray McLean. Ray McLean was a friend of mine, a lawyer. But Ray was pretty far out. I mean, Ray was maybe, you might say, beyond liberal. And, um, and, and he was opposed by Arthur Christopher, who was the most gentle soul that you would ever know of me. Just the nicest person in the world. Well, it turns out that Arthur Christopher <coughs> beat Ray McLean, and the composition of Joe's, Mayor Riley's first city council was six and six. So Robert tells me the story that after the election, Palmer came up to Morris and said, well, let me go back. So, 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 Ray Ray is ultra liberal, and so he certainly wasn't going to appeal to the white vote, right? And and Arthur Arthur Christopher was the nicest guy in the world, and so so Morris Morris I mean Robert I mean Palmer came to Morris and said, "What the hell happened, Morris?" And Morris said, "How the hell would I know that the white go, the white vote would go for the black guy and the black vote would go for the white?" <laughs> We ended up 6-6, six, six. and probably, probably the most harmonious um, example of city leadership that this city will ever see. Uh, who is the one incumbent? Uh, that is the one, that one, is one incumbent council member. <coughs> And there were, there were 12 council members. So that meant that Mayor Riley came into office fresh off the boat, and as did 11 of the 12 council members. And that's what, that's what kicked it off. Now, uh, in, in the General Assembly, Mayor Riley, Joe, my friend, um, hit the ground running as one of the progressive members of the State House of Representatives. I've already given you the example of how he donated his share of the money to, uh, to campaign funds to the African-American candidates. Um, he, uh, 
he, he sponsored legislation uh, uh, in the areas of reform of education, in the areas of upgrading our technical education, uh, in, in every progressive means that you could imagine. I, 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 I know we're probably pressed for time, so I would allude to, to Brian Hicks. Book. But he was known, Mayor Riley was known in the, in the General Assembly as a progressive leader. He was trusted by all. So the, often you will hear politicians fabricate the story about how they were recruited to run. I was persuaded by my constituents to run. They had to talk me into it. Well, Joe served for Three, three terms, three terms, and, and decided to retire. He, he had, by then, two sons, and his, he promised Charlotte that he would run for one term, and he got away with three, uh, and, and, but he decided to retire. He was coming back to practice law. And I, I, can, I can attest to the fact that there was a constant parade of the street. Our office was upstairs. Um, of people coming in saying, Joe, you have got to run for mayor. Um, Herbert Fielding, uh, Robert Woods, who, another African-American who had since been elected to the, to the, to the General Assembly. You've, you've, you've got to run. Business leaders, Hugh Lane, the, the president of, I guess, what was then the CNS Bank. Um, you, you've got to run. There was a this was not a fabricated um, idea. This was not a fabricated story that Joe Riley was, was, was persuaded to run. He, 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 he literally was prevailed upon by the greater community to run, and uh, the rest of it is told in Brian Hicks' book. So the, the arc, the arc of justice, the, the compelling arc, that stimulated Joe Riley running for mayor was this arc of social justice. <clears throat> Not one of us had the faintest idea that he would also happen to be the most creative urban planner in municipal government that this country has ever discovered. So that was a that was a bonus that Mayor Riley turned out to be not only a leader in social justice, but a true artist in the architecture of, thing, of all things civic, both, both physical and, and intangible. That's the end of my story. <laughs>
African-American man at Lakeslayo, and he said, Joe, and he was very soft-spoken, and um, he came in and sat down, and he said, Joe, you're doing too much for black people in the turn you live. And I said, well, Herbert, first of all, it's very nice of you to come in, and, um, but, but I, I know what I'm doing. I said it in a nice way. I mean, I knew that I was pushing, but I, but I, it, that's what was required. That was required to, to move this city and, and, and move it to people just to get us, people of goodwill, just, just to, to get us, you know, to get us going and to give the, the African Americans a true sense that this was their city. And, uh, and I think, uh, and I'll stop the question, but, but I think that, that doing that, and that, that was lots of action, it wasn't just talk doing things at the neighborhoods and, and people bringing to the government, that I think that that was that, that what all the things that we have achieved together in Charleston, of which we're proud, that, that, that having that sense of, of ownership and that it was theirs was, was, a, was a necessary precondition to to so much of what we celebrate in Charleston. Now. So with that, let me ask, ask your questions. And um, I don't know if we've got a moving mic, but we probably, I think the acoustics are good here. So uh, any questions or comments, Professor Taylor? It can be about what we discussed, whatever. You're nice to comment. I know I, w I don't want to miss the opportunity of your ideas or questions. So it's always hard to be the first one to ask a question. Jimmy? And I'm wondering, yeah. <laughs> I don't need that. Um, Joe, I think of Don and Puck, um, thinking back into the 60s and the 70s and what was happening around America. And I think we would be remiss not to say that we were so lucky to have Fritz Hollins and President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and uh, Reverend Abernathy and, and, and what happened, seeing what was happening in America gave us, those of our generation, the reason to say we need to do such and such. And, and I think in that context, those people who the national left me, both President Johnson as well, deserve so much credit for leading us as a generation. Well, thank you, Jimmy, they did. And, and that was, um, you know, and, and Dr. King, um, whose birthday we celebrate next week. Um, but uh, um, Ralph McGill was the editor of the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. And he was a very progressive uh, Southern journalist. And um, he wrote that Dr. King did as much for white Southerners as he did for black Southerners because he exposed white southerners of goodwill to their conscious, consciousness. And, um, and, and that's what, what those leaders did to uh, President Kennedy and Prince when, you know, when Harvey Gantt, the first African American to be enrolled in a college in South Carolina, um, Clemson, and when the other southern governors were using that for political gain and standing in the courthouse door and railing against it and we'll never and make the marshals make us bring in these black people into our schools with our children and all like that. Chris Hollings uh, said uh, we've run out of courts and, uh, and we're going to admit Harvey Gantt peacefully into Clemson University. And that was that was that was just so different. And so all of those we all, you know, we we have and, and those who with us have the we have a chance to inspire, they have a chance to inspire. They really did. Another question. Yes. Um, yes, you know, you really stepped out and were in front of so many things in the seventies. And I just want you to just tell us a little bit about your daddy and what it was like for him being your daddy and um, how that worked for you in terms of your being so out there in the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, my, my daddy was the best daddy, and, and he was a civic leader. He was a great civic leader. He never ran for office. His, his, but the same, you know, those of us who, I mean, I see my, I'm an elected official, but I'm a, it's civic, you know. Uh, my colleagues at Bill Moody and, and the council members, it, it's civic. You're trying to, you're doing it to make the community better. And that was my daddy, and that's what we grew up with and around the dinner table and then our home and all of that. So he was from, he, you know, my stance on, on some of these issues were hard for him, as it would have been, it was hard for people of his, of his generation. And, um, you know, I, I guess it was, God bless him, you know, he, the, the news, it was in the news that I was appointing a black man as police chief. And I mean, that was for daddy like the last straw, you know. <laughs> and he called me and he said, son, is it true that you're hiring this um, person of color to be the chief of police? And I said, yes, sir. You know, he's, um, but he, you know, but, but my father was progressive. He was a progressive person. And um, it was just that, that their generation had a hard time on that. And he was, he was kind and loving to African Americans and those who, who worked with him and they loved him. But it was, you know, um, someone said that the difference between the South and the North <coughs> about racial progress is that in the North, white people didn't um, mind black people getting high. They just didn't want them close. And in the South, we didn't mind them being close because we grew up next to each other. But, but didn't want them high. It was, that, that was hard thing because they had grown up with this Jim Crow, you know, suppression of, of opportunity. But, um, but my father, like, like Charlestonians, he grew to admire Reuben Greenberg immensely. He uh, was proud of, the, proud of the progress that the city was being made. And, and what I knew my job as leader, because I, I, knew, I knew the will, goodwill was there. I knew the, the citizens, when Herbert Fielding told me I was hurting myself, I knew it wasn't, it was going to be bumpy. Just going to be bumpy. But, but we were, we were, it was at, at the heart of, of, of history was bending towards justice and we just had to, you know, keep, keep pushing. Yes, Arthur? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you for being there for this 40 years. And uh, when people use the terminology boots on the ground, I would like to thank you for creating that in, in the city of Charleston. Thank you. Because like the Miranda Holmes and Arthur Christopher and the rest of the individuals, we know that when anyone uh, get elected in the city of Charleston, you had to have the, the boots on the ground and you created a system to make sure that you had those particular votes and to move Charleston ahead. Well, and uh, the city of Charleston Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and he's one of our great leaders. He was he's president of Eastside Neighborhood Council. How long? Uh, over 25 years. Yeah. And wonderful leader. And that's you know uh, I let me tell you what I did nothing by myself. I did my I had wonderful city council. Had wonderful city staff. Had wonderful citizens and engaged people. You know, uh, the city city government is you you. It only works when you have when you have people engaged, and we, we just have to engage, and then give you ideas. And you know, I told the early class, Jimmy, um, I gave them an article that was in the paper a month ago about the homeless uh, person, front page picture, who was homeless, and he's at the money place, and now has a job working in a restaurant. General. So I gave them that. That was their reading, and and I gave them that because I, I told them that, and they're hearing it again, but, but um, one of the interesting things about this job, the mayor in a democracy, is that you can have the chance
to leverage all of the, the goodness of people. And so I told them the story that um, the coldest <coughs> winter in Charleston, the year the Oleanders died in the early 80s, and it was so cold that the, for the first time we saw something we didn't know existed, and that was homelessness. Because they came out of the mud of the cars and the abandoned houses and the vestibule of churches or in the entrance to stores or whatever, all these people because they couldn't take it anymore. And so a group of ministers and I got together and uh, we quickly decided we needed a shelter. We opened it at the top of the St. Julian Divine Center, to announced the paper. We have a home of the shelter open, didn't know if anybody come, and people came, and that then the citizens got involved in the non volunteers and raised money in the nonprofit. Now we got 180 places, the best comprehensive shop for homeless in America. Thousands of people volunteer their year. They raised millions of dollars. They built new buildings and got transitional housing and after war. And that's, that's the, the, the joy of this job is you get to, to work with the citizens and you, you help you know, create new initiatives and then, then they take over. Uh, and it's a really, I had a professor once the kids heard this, he was writing a book about mayors, and this was years ago, and he, he said, Mayor, you've been involved in, how many institutions you've been involved in, you know, creating or whatever. And my first response, I mean, to myself, well, I don't, we don't do institutions. I mean, I told them all the jobs we created and all that. And then I kept my mouth shut for a minute of thought. And of course, they were countless. And sometimes the mayor, you just give somebody support. Sometimes you bring people together. Sometimes some, the city has to start and get going, or uh, homeless, uh, <coughs> not uh, affordable housing, all like that. But, but Jimmy is a great example of, of what he did, uh, being imbued with the uh, American capacity for entrepreneurship and teaching that to these kids. And how many? Going through that now, Jimmy? 20,000. 20,000. So that's, and that's what, and you know, you just, as mayor, you get to connect with and sometimes help nations like that. Darren? Uh, I was very interested to hear you make a comment that uh, when uh, 7 Fielding came to see you and said that you were doing too much, and you told him, I know what I'm doing. And it, it brought a thought back to my mind in 1982, I was working at Northern uh, Radio. And Samson Newman, uh, Rabbi Quincy Newman, had um, heard about me from some friends because they were opening a radio station in Columbia. And he came down to ask me would I come up to Columbia and help them to get the station on and actually as the manager of the station. But um, sometime around my time in Columbia, I think it must have been 1984, and they did a feature story on you in the state newspaper. It was a Sunday paper. They do these exposés, and the story starts out on page 1A, and it finishes up on page 4, 5, and 6A, you know, that kind of thing. They were telling you a story. It was very interesting because they interviewed Nancy Hawk, and I think she ran against you in 75. Right, right. She was. And uh, they were asking Nancy Hawk about you and just quoting her. And she was saying that they led an effort to keep you from developing Charleston Place because of the usage of funds, you know, local funds right. and developing money. And that kind of thing. And the, the uh, guy that wrote the article asked her, well, why did they stop? And her quote was, and I'll never forget it, her quote in the state newspaper was, because he never quits. <laughs> <laughs> Another question for we, yeah, yeah. Peter Riley, could you tell the students about the commissioning of the Martin Ashman study in 1976 that led to the revitalization of downtown very quickly, which talks about Charles. Well, um, do this, because I, I know you got, we got two and a half minutes. The um, King Street was dying, as I mentioned, and we didn't. You know, and what do you do when cities around the country are trying to stuff and did, did not stand and tear stuff down or whatever? And um, so, luckily, we, working with the Chamber of Commerce, um, agreed to have a study, and then the city funded the whole thing. Remember, 100, 100 grand, 
and uh, picked this firm, and um, and what we realized was that it was a it was like a severe illness, and you needed to diagnose it, and then you needed to come up with the various restorative um, cures. So we studied the Central Business District, developed a strategic plan, uh, and then, then carefully followed. So oftentimes in American City, somebody would say, scratch the head, and let's do something, or get one of those developments like did in the city. Well, it's an ecosystem. And each city is different. And so the Wharton Ashman plan said that the first uh, energy creating place needed to be at the corner of Market King B, which was a vacant lot. And um, so that's, we, we followed it uh, and stuck with it. Every 10 years you'd upgrade it to whatever, refine it. Well, but it gave us a battle plan. So rather than just wondering or trying to something, you know, or tear down some more buildings or whatever is, is and that's, that's what we did. It took a long time and it was controversial uh, but we, we had a game plan, uh, and we were confident that, that it would be a winning game plan, and you just didn't give up. Well, thank you all so much. Uh,